All right, hello everyone. This is Natalie. I'm secretary of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. Today we have Akar Bard Baj presenting to us players and users wargaming as a user experience design problem. Akar, take it away. Hi everybody. Um, I'll just uh, start my presentation. So uh, as a quick overview, uh, I'm gonna give a quick introduction to myself, explain what user experience or UX design is, go through a brief history of UX design, uh, describe the best practices for UX design as a process, go through some major concepts of UX design, and then give some recommendations for game design. Uh, just a standard caveat, uh, the opinions expressed in this presentation are my own and not necessarily those of my employer or any of my customers. So who am I? My name is Akar Bardvaj. I am a war game designer at the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, I am also a hobby board game designer, um, designer of a game called Tyranny of Blood, which is hopefully coming out next year. Uh, my personal academic and professional background uh, is mostly analytical, but I've also studied graphic design and uh, done some of it professionally. So uh, between studying graphic design and uh, studying UX design and doing it as a job. Uh, that's kind of my expertise in this talk today. So what is UX design? Uh, here's a definition I like to give. Uh, it's from Don Norman and Jacob Nielsen, some of the pioneers of the field. Uh, as you can see, user experience encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. What does that mean? That means it is an interdisciplinary field. Uh, typically the graphic design portion of UX design gets over-prioritized, but really it's more than that. It's a larger umbrella. Uh, there's a psychological component uh, where you have to understand your users as you define user uh, experiences. And there's also a solutions engineering and testing part. So long story short, user, your user experience design is exactly what it sounds like you are designing an experience for a specific set of users. Typically uh, that is set in the, the world of software, but it uh, varies considerably all the way to game design, which I'm talking about today. So why is this relevant to game design? Uh, in UX design, the users use a solution to meet a specific objective. They need to learn to use complex solutions, often with little designer input. They benefit when the solution is intuitive or even fun, and they can help uh, improve solutions through participating in user testing. Uh, so that's what users do. And what do players do? Literally exactly the same thing. So this is why we study this today, uh, to understand how UX design can help us improve our games. Uh, as a caveat, when I give examples, uh, most of them will come from the hobby board game design world, but all of these lessons apply just as well to professional game design. So now for a brief history of uh, UX design. Starts all the way in 4000 BC when the Chinese defined feng shui. Uh, they tried to make a living environment harmonious to improve, improve the flow of qi. What that meant was they analyzed the experience that a person lived in and tried to improve it. But 3,500 years uh, down the road, Hippocrates uh, defined the optimal environment to allow for human beings to practice medicine efficiently. Uh, before then, people just did medicine wherever. In this case, uh, he designed a table where a patient could sleep to make sure that the doctor uh, had easy access and was comfortable uh, for a long period of time so the doctor wouldn't make mistakes. Cut another almost 2,000 years, we get to 1911. Uh, when Frederick Winslow Taylor defined a series of best practices, uh, applying a scientific understanding to managing workers. Uh, this was in the Industrial Revolution, so he didn't quite have his workers' interests in mind. He was mostly focused on efficiency, but uh, he still was a pioneer of the field. Even if, uh, he's a bit controversial today. In 1945, uh, Bell Labs hired a psychologist named John E. Carlin. Uh, Johnny Carlin uh, took a human-centered approach to understanding how machines should be designed, and uh, his research led to the touchstone phone, uh, that great invention that we all use today. 
1952, uh, Walt Disney hired engineers to design Disneyland. Uh, he, called, he would go on to call them Imagineers. Uh, it was a portmanteau of imagination and engineers. Their big focus was on designing not just a theme park, but an entire experience. Uh, and they focus on the tiniest details with the goal that you could have a fun day at Disneyland without riding a single ride. And in 1969, uh, Xerox opened uh, its Palo Alto Research Center, which was another core of UX design. Uh, this center was uh, really important to introducing human-friendly technologies. This is where uh, the first mouse was developed, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, this is also where a graphic use, graphical user interface was invented. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then in 1988, uh, Don Norman, would, who would eventually invent the term UX design, uh, published his, uh, his book, The Psychology of Everyday Things. Uh, the book is now called The Design of Everyday Things, but it's basically the discipline defining book on user experience design. Okay, now that we've gone through a whirlwind process, I'm gonna go through UX design as, as a process. Um, just a heads up, I'm, uh, I'm going super fast because I'm defining an entire discipline in about 45 minutes. Uh, this is not by any means a thorough explanation of user experience design. I would highly recommend that you read more after this, but this is just to give you a taste. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, UX design is an interdisciplinary field of these three sections. And as such, the process that people use for user experience design is also uh, interdisciplinary. So we begin with user research. That's the psychology portion, where we understand the people who are gonna use our solution. Then we move on to prototyping, which is kind of the graphic design part, where we uh, do an iterative creative process to understand best solution to the problem mentioned earlier. And then lastly, we do uh, building and testing. So that is we work with engineers uh, and I'm defining engineers broadly. Uh, basically, we work with the people who are actually implementing the solution to make sure that it meets all needs that the users have. So uh, we start off uh, another way to view this uh, entire process is design thinking. So uh, this is one way of viewing it as a five-step process. You empathize, which is you research the users, you understand the problem, then you define the problem, uh, and you express it in a human-centric manner. Then you ideate, you identify innovative solutions, and then you prototype. You uh, choose the best solution among the ideas you had and iteratively redesign it, uh, improving it each time. Lastly, you test out the idea, you try it out with real world users to determine feasibility and figure out ways to improve your solution. Yet another way of viewing this process is through convergence and divergence. So this graphic here is what's called the double diamond process. Uh, you start off with, uh, and you're moving left to right, you start off with a divergent process of discovery uh, where you come up with lots of ideas and then a convergent process of definition where um, as you discover the problem, you converge on the specific aspects of the problem that you can solve with your solution. So after you take the divergent convergent approach to get to the real problem, then you move on to the design phase where the divergent part of it is you develop lots of designs to understand uh, the best solutions to the problem. And after that, you deliver on uh, one of those solutions. So again, you diverge, you come up with a whole bunch of ideas and then you converge, you bring it back to one. Uh, in this case, you get one problem, one solution. Uh, typically, divergent thinking is better done in a group, preferably a diverse one. Uh, and I'm defining diversity broadly, not just demographics, but also functional uh, diversity. Whereas convergent thinking is better done either alone or in smaller groups. Uh, after that, uh, so as the process I mentioned, it begins with user research. Uh, in this case, uh, you would do qualitative and quantitative analysis in a wargaming, professional wargaming context. That basically means talking to the sponsor, understanding their specific needs, 
and drilling down to their actual needs, which might not be what they uh, explicitly mentioned. Um, then you can choose a diverse set of likely users. So in user experience design, that typically uh, involves getting a focus group together, uh, sending out a survey, understanding a broad group of users of a solution and uh, what they specifically need. Uh, so once you understand those use cases, then you can move on to really understanding the problem as it exists. Uh, in wargaming context, maybe uh, you don't have multiple users per se, but you might have a lot of different stakeholders. So maybe your core sponsor isn't the, the whole of the problem that you're trying to solve. Maybe you have a large group of people that have their own take in it. But uh, be careful not to overdo it. Uh, make sure you don't go for too broad a set of needs, but you do want to touch on all the stakeholders. So uh, ways you can do user research, uh, you can use structured analytic techniques and liberating structures. Uh, if you're not familiar with these, I would highly recommend these two books. Basically, these are fun little methods you can use to uh, get people talking and uh, discussing their problems, break up big complicated ideas into smaller ones and uh, really get at the specific problems that you need to solve. Uh, user researchers also have a set of tools they use. Uh, for instance, journey mapping. So uh, in this case, uh, user researchers will posit a scenario, uh, break a solution into discrete steps and sub-steps, and then map out how the customer relates to it. So in this case, you can see this curve. This represents frustration and joy. And uh, by mapping this out graphically, uh, it's not quite specific quantitative numbers, but uh, by mapping out graphically, you can uh, see the points that need the most work and the most redesign. For a game, uh, you can use these sort of graphics to map out a turn structure or the core game loop. And as you test the, as you play test the mechanics, you can understand the player's pain points, confusion, parts that need fixing, et cetera. Another tool that user researchers use are called user personas. Uh, these are essentially that make up fake people, uh, plausible to fake people uh, as a way to build empathy and better understand user needs. So in this case, we have reliability researcher, Rachel. Um, and uh, you can see she has a specific uh, biography, specific list of core needs, and a specific set of behaviors that uh, she is likely to take on. Now, what this does is this helps uh, uh, break you of your own assumptions. So you can start thinking uh, not so much what would a car bar budge do, but what would reliability researcher Rachel do? Oftentimes, user researchers will print out a bunch of these, hang them up in their cubicle, and over the course of the day, just as they're trying to think of ideas, just kind of ponder and put themselves in these situations to better understand. Um, Maybe you don't need all this for a war game, but uh, these sort of tools can help you preempt confusion among your players. Uh, now uh, we move on from user research to design. Uh, the best practices for UX design are iterative prototyping. So you can see this graphic here. It goes from low fidelity to high fidelity. So you start off with a hand-drawn sketch uh, and then a, wire, a digital wireframe, uh, and then you keep going. Uh, now, why do we do this? So uh, the main benefit of starting off simple as a hand-drawn uh, sketch is you don't get stuck with solutions. If you spend too much time mapping out specific details too early, you might not be able to break yourself up a little bit. Uh, and so you wanna stay flexible as possible. In this case, by doing a hand-drawn sketch, you just get the basic core of what the idea is. You also notice they don't really add color until pretty late. And that's because color could often distract from the, the core idea of your solution. And um, it also might waste a lot of time if you try to pick a color scheme too early. You should really hammer down the basic idea of your solution. The metaphor people use is if you're building a car, you want to start by building a skateboard and then keep developing it from there. 
put on an engine, uh, you put in a steering column, et cetera. Uh, work iteratively, that's a better process to design a solution. Um, design is the most complex, longest uh, part of this. And so it's also gonna be the part I talk about the least. Um, there's way better resources than I can give you in this short period of time, uh, but I will encourage you to read more about uh, the actual design process. After design, you go through the user experience testing. Uh, in a war game context, this is play testing typically. And uh, typically the way, you, the best practices for play testing is to test specific processes independently rather than an entire game at once. And uh, the advantage of that is if you test individual processes, you can isolate the problems early on. Once you've tested individual processes, then you can bring them together and uh, get an understanding of the problems as a whole. Um, for UX testing and play testing, there's two kinds. There's guided testing and blind testing. Typically, uh, early on in the play test, it's okay to do guided testing just to get players through uh, the big hurdle. Uh, after that, you can do blind play testing to make sure the players are able to play it even without your inputs. Because remember, in the actual war game, you don't want to play the game for your players. Uh, you want to make sure they have all their decisions and that they understand everything that they can do in the war game without you acting as a crutch. Ideally, uh, as you do play testing, you want to do multiple rounds with very different people. Um, if you keep doing the same play testing with the same people, you end up getting uh, biased results and you might not discover problems that other people might find when they break the game. Um, you also want to uh, take extensive notes and be quantitative as possible. This can be difficult with professional wargaming, but um, as much as you can, mark down where people feel frustrated, where people uh, have insights, et cetera. Uh, and ideally, um, I know I had said you do user research, then design, then testing. Ideally, you want to do these cyclically. So after you do a play test, you want to have another iteration of designing and then another play test, et cetera. And do this in a cycle uh, to really uh, improve your design as much as possible. Okay, uh, sorry, one second. All right, um, now is comes to the interactive part and I have not done this virtually yet. So uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to introduce some major concepts in uh, UX design. For each of these, I will define the concept and I'll provide a non-gaming example. And then I'll ask you to provide an example that you can think of in gaming. Again, this can be hobby gaming, this can be professional war gaming, but it's just to get you thinking in these terms. All the examples I provide here come from commercial hobby games. They're just easier to find pictures of but again, the lessons apply to professional as well. <clears throat> so the first uh, most important concept in the UX design is empathy. Um, so the big uh, slogan people, UX designers say is you are not the user. In this case, you are not the player. So you might think you have the best idea. You might think a solution is intuitive, but you are not the person that you're designing for. So uh, what you think doesn't matter so much. You need to have empathy for the users, for the players, and you need to put yourselves in their shoes. Uh, empathy is the core of human-centered design. Uh, we call it human-centered design because the center is the human being. It's the users that uh, we're trying to uh, solve problems for. And the good thing for us is that gaming at its core is the most empathetic art form that exists. You're literally placing players into a world where they have a different incentive structure from what they have in the real world. And they're trying to understand how they would react in these circumstances. So empathy allows players to uh, embody their roles, reduce mirror imaging. So if you are uh, playing out a war game as another country, for instance, uh, you can't think as an American, you have to think as the people from that country. Uh, and it allows you to play through a scenario or another incentive structure. 
So an example of empathy uh, in the real world, uh, we have, this is a negative, negative example. This is what UX designers refer to as a dark pattern. So uh, what's wrong with this image here? You can see this is kind of an old uh, Skype installation window. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, this installation of Skype forces you to make Bing your search engine and MSN your homepage. And it hides this in tiny text because when you install software, typically you just click continue until it's done. This is called a dark pattern. This is the explicit use of user experience design to create a negative uh, impact on your users. Uh, this is considered a no-no. So this is an example of uh, user experience designer not being empathetic to its users uh, because it's prevent the UX designer uh, presented a solution that is not what the user wanted. So can anyone think of an example of empathy or the lack thereof in gaming? Uh, can you put it in the chat, please? All right, for this first one, I'll, uh, I'll give the example. So uh, the example I have here is uh, rule book design. So uh, there's, there's a way to explain rules in a way that your players will understand. Uh, and there's a, a, a way that they won't. So in this case, I've given examples from two different games. Uh, these two pages are literally the same rule set. And you'll notice the difference. The one on the left is not, uh, quite designed to be user-friendly. It's designed to get a maximum amount of information on a page. Um, whereas the one on the right is specifically uh, considering what does the player need to get to in, in order to play this step of the game. And so you can see there's more white space, it's more readable, the icons are larger. Uh, the one on the left is about half uh, design notes, which uh, isn't, it's really interesting maybe, but it's not necessarily what your player needs when the player is going through a rule book. Uh, and you can see the layout on the right is a lot clearer. Okay, uh, the next concept is accessibility. You have a legal and an ethical obligation to be accessible to uh, as many people as possible. So you might've heard of section 508. It is a federal uh, requirement that all Government-related solutions are accessible uh, to uh, certain types of disabilities. What does that mean? That means that uh, your text needs to be large and readable, your content needs to be colorblind friendly, and you need to use high contrast colors when appropriate. Uh, to, uh, people often don't do this, especially the, the colorblind aspect, because sometimes it's difficult. There's a huge tendency to use red and green in games, which are the two colors that colorblind people have the most trouble distinguishing. Uh, and that's a problem. Someone who can't tell red and green apart can, will struggle with the actual game. The, uh, the great thing about accessibility is, yes, we do it for uh, a small group of people, but accessibility helps everybody. Uh, and here's my example of the real world. We have a curb ramp. If you've uh, been on a sidewalk recently, you have walked in one of these. And yes, this, these were designed to help people who need wheelchairs to uh, get to where they're going. But anyone who, anytime you've uh, walked with a roller bag or you've moved furniture on a dolly, you have probably used one of these ramps and it's been very helpful. So this is a case where accessibility helps everybody. Okay, uh, can people think of an example of accessibility in gaming? Put in the chat. Um, okay, I see some uh, command monitor operations uh, requires uh, Lua coding. I'm not sure what that is, but yeah, that's that's a case of not being accessible to everybody. Um, yes. Uh, so really, it says uh, strongly differentiated game pieces. That's correct. That's a good way to make a game accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, Ken says, using shape and texture for meeples as well as color. Uh, multilingual instructions, these are great examples. Um, yep, so uh, Ray says you can't read a lot of the text in video games. 
Uh, a lot of games allow you to increase and decrease the size of the text, and that's very useful. So um, you guys have mentioned this, but in the, the example I use is colorblind friendly design. So you can see two different games here. Twilight Imperium is in the upper right corner. Uh, not only are the pieces only defined by their colors, but you can see there's black pieces here, which are really difficult to see on the board. I love this game, but uh, this is a problem and this makes the game not accessible. If you are colorblind, you cannot play a full six player game of Twilight Imperium. Uh, and something like 12% of, uh, of men are colorblind, at least red green. So that's a big problem. In the bottom left, we have Splendor, and uh, each of these tokens has a different color, but it also has a different jewel shape. So even if you can't see the colors on the tokens, you can pretty much see, okay, this is a ruby or an emerald. You can tell by the shape. Uh, so colorblind people have no have little problem playing Splendor. All right, the next concept is a very big word. It's skeuomorphism, which is the longest word I will say today. Skeuomorphism, is essentially using interface objects to mimic real world counterparts. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, if you can think of a situation in which you've used a, a graphical user interface and uh, the symbols on the interface resemble the real world counterparts, uh, that is skeuomorphism. What are the pros of this? The pros are basically, it's very easy to understand. If you've used the real world uh, representation of what the interface shows, then you are already well on your way to understanding what the interface does. The cons are uh, sometimes skeuomorphism can be limiting. Um, computers uh, can do a lot of things the real world can't. So if we use, uh, if we depend on real world solutions to provide these inputs, we're limiting ourselves. Uh, they might be maximalist. Some of these, uh, some of these real-world metaphors can be more than is necessary. And over time, as people uh, get used to the solution, they might not need that connection to reality anymore. So uh, Ken is already ahead of me on this. Uh, my example in the non-gaming world of uh, skeuomorphism is icons. So you can see here on the upper left, that's a shopping cart icon. If you've used a shopping cart in real life, and most of you have, you know, you knew the first time you used amazon.com what the shopping cart did. Uh, if you use Windows and you've used a recycle bin in real life, you knew what the recycle bin did. And uh, here on the bottom right, we see an example of a weird limitation. Um, I know most of you are students and younger than me, so a lot of you probably won't remember what that symbol is. You know, it means save. Um, it's, but it's a floppy disk, which no one's used for over 20 years. And so this is a case where the symbol is nice and people generally know what it means, but the connection to reality has been broken. So that might be a limitation. Uh, another example here, this is uh, some audio software. Uh, they have knobs and sliders, just like actual audio editing equipment does. Uh, you can even see wires on the bottom. Um, this is great if you've used uh, analog audio editing equipment, but, or audio mixing rather. But if you haven't, this interface might not be the ideal interface. Okay, so y'all know where I'm going with this. What is an example of skeuomorphism or metaphor in gaming? Just type it in the chat. Uh, uh, yep. So uh, Ken says different shapes for wooden tokens, fortresses, scouts, and armies, and pen dragon. Uh, sure. Yep. That that is a case where uh, the artifact in the game resembles reality. So on that note, the example I give here is miniatures. So if you play a miniatures game, yep. Jeff says money and monopoly. That's perfect. So if you if you play a miniatures game, you'll see little soldiers and uh, ramparts and such. Uh, and that is representative of a real soldier, a real rampart in reality. So it has a good connection to reality, so it's easier to learn. But then the flaw is that miniature games can be pretty expensive. And so if you can simplify it, maybe you can make a solution that works for more people. Uh, yep, lots of great examples uh, come in the chat. 
Okay, uh, the opposite of skeuomorphism is what we call flat design. This is a minimalist style that doesn't necessarily reflect reality. So the idea here is you wanna go as simple, that this concept is going as simple as possible, um, even if it doesn't connect to the real world. The pros for this, it's simple and clean, especially when people have al already learned the system and it avoids distraction. The cons are that it can be unintuitive and hard to learn. Because there's not a real world example for it, uh, it might take a little longer to get used to it. So uh, the non-gaming example I have here is uh, we have on the left, Apple iBooks, which was Apple's first uh, ebook library. And what do you see there? You see a bookshelf. And uh, what Apple designers realized was that people still had trouble understanding the concept of an ebook, uh, much less a library of them. So by making an actual shelf in the interface, people could better understand how eBooks worked. Uh, and what happened over time? People learned what eBooks were, they didn't need the shelf anymore. So when Apple did a redesign, uh, they did on the right, they used a more flat design. Uh, they got rid of the bookshelf. But you can still see there's limitations. Uh, the picture on the right still has the real scanned book covers on it. And uh, there are slightly different shapes you can see. And that's still uh, kind of an unnecessary limitation, but it still helps users understand the solution. Okay, uh, can anyone think of an example of flat design in gaming? Uh, yep, uh, Rex Brennan has a good point, which is that uh, symbology doesn't mean the same thing. It's very culturally dependent. Yep, Ken, Ken, do you have my slides already? Uh, NATO symbols are an example of flat design. So um, again, these don't really look like uh, their uh, counterparts in reality, but they're loosely based on it. Um, so the symbol on the top is for infantry, and that symbol is uh, cross swords from the Napoleonic era. Symbol on the bottom is for armor. Uh, the symbol is uh, the treads of a tank, very simplified. And so the flaw here is it took a little effort for people to learn these things. And thankfully, most of the people who learned these things were in the military, so they were made to learn these things. But um, there is that learning curve. But once you get over that, uh, you don't need a full on miniature anymore. You can just have a little cardboard chip. So, uh, NATO symbology is actually a pretty good example of uh, design where they made things intricate, but still very simple and very clean to tell apart once you know the system. Um, this is one of my favorite examples, uh, one of my favorite concepts of UX design, rather. Uh, affordances. So an affordance is a relationship between the properties of an object and the capabilities of the agent that uh, needs to use the object. What does that mean? That means that your brain wants you to do things that conform to the human body. So if you see something that is roughly shaped like your hand, there is part of you that wants to grab it. If you see a stump, as you're walking through the woods, if it's the right height, part of you wants to sit on that stump and use it as a chair. Your brain is constantly looking at the world and understanding ways that it can use it. Uh, and so your goal as a designer should be to reduce that space and uh, don't make your brain do too much work. Any way that you can naturally uh, conform to the human body, uh, that is good design. Uh, and one important thing to remember is that not all agents have the same capabilities. So you need to design for your users. And uh, remember my point earlier about accessibility. Uh, not everyone has the same abilities or the same needs. So make sure you conform to the user needs. Okay, my non-game example for affordances. Uh, this is based on the screenshot I used uh, for the Eventbrite page. Uh, what do you see that's bad design in these pictures? These are so-called Norman doors. And you can see, yes, Connor nailed it. Uh, it's the same handles with different labels. And so what does your brain do when you see uh, these handles? Your brain sees something roughly the size of your hand and it wants to grab it and pull it. And the fact that the doors on the left 
you can't pull, you have to push, uh, is bad design because they actually had to have a sign saying push or pull. And one of the hardest things your brain has to do is read. So if you have to read a word in order to use a door, uh, that's way more effort than uh, your brain should uh, have to do just to get through a door. So better design, uh, a lot of times you see uh, doors like this where it looks like this on the pull side, but on the push side, it's a flat panel. And the flat panel, you wanna put your hand on it. Uh, so that's better design. Unfortunately, I think it's slightly more expensive, so uh, it's rare. Uh, okay, um, Kevin Williamson has a question. With respect to affordances, what would you say is a healthy cross between simplification and giving multiple ways for a user to solve a problem? That's a very good question. Um, because remember, in wargaming, you generally want to give your users a degree of free reign. So I would say affordances are better. Um, they're better for the interfacing part of it. So you want to use affordances to connect your players to the mechanics and the scenario. You don't want to use affordances to predetermine uh, a path to of action, basically. That makes sense. Okay, uh, can someone think of an example of affordances in gaming? Put it in the chat. Okay, uh, Ken mentioned special icons on dice for Star Wars X-Wing. Um, I think that's probably more of an example of metaphor. Um, it's because uh, the icons aren't quite conforming to uh, the, the human body, even though they do help you understand what is on the dice. All right, this one's a little tricky. Uh, examples are, uh, I give our game piece design. Yep, Kevin said deck of cards, that's true. Yes, uh, yep, cards are perfect. Cards are size to fit your hand. And um, those are great. And that's why, that's why it's great playing with a normal poker size deck of cards, but then sometimes you play a game with really tiny cards, it's less satisfying. Uh, and here's some uh, examples uh, beyond that. So chess pieces are shaped this way because they perfectly fit between your fingers. It's very satisfying to move a chess piece. Poker chips are my favorite. I, if any time I see a stack of poker chips, you know that feeling where part of you just wants to grab it and just drop it and hear that clang and it's so satisfying, it's perfect. Uh, dominoes are the same way. And what do we see on the bottom right? Uh, we see a, a kind of poor use of affordances, right? Here we have a game with uh, big stacks of counters. I'm sure this game's great, but the counters don't really make good use of affordances. Uh, which is why the player needs tweezers just to grab them. Um, there's better ways of doing this. Maybe, uh, obviously there's trade-offs there. If they had bigger pieces, they could uh, put less of them on the board, which is a limitation. But in this case, it doesn't quite work with uh, the human hand. Okay, uh, next we have typographic hierarchy. Uh, Typographic hierarchy is using visual cues uh, to reflect the importance of text. So essentially when you have a whole bunch of text, um, you want, some of it's gonna be more important than other uh, bits of it. And so you wanna prioritize the important stuff. The more important the text is on the page, the more it should pop out. So how do we get a uh, typographic hierarchy? How do we set it so that the most important text is most visible and the least important text is most visible? There's lots of ways you can do that. Here we have some examples. We have font size. Bigger text is easier to read. Um, excuse me. We have boldness, italics, color, and font type. So the important thing to note is you can very easily overdo it, as you see here. If you emphasize a lot of stuff on a page, you're emphasizing nothing. So uh, you really want to set that balance. Uh, so what's my uh, non-gaming example? Here we have a page from the New York Times. Uh, you can see this one actually does it pretty well. Uh, this could be messy, but there's uh, enough of a focus in each section that uh, your brain doesn't get overloaded. 
So the most important thing here is the New York Times. Uh, you can see that big text, uh, big, beautiful uh, font. Uh, not very readable, but it, you can see it and uh, it's the clearest thing on the page. Elsewhere on this page, you can see uh, font size used, boldness, italics, uh, red coloring. And uh, this is useful on a newspaper page where you're only supposed to take a bit of it at a time. If this were, say, an advertisement or a poster, it would be a mess. Uh, so in that case, the, uh, the solution fits the problem. Um, does anyone have an idea of how typographic hierarchy can be used in gaming? Rule books, great. Mm -hmm. Yep, so in rule books, uh, you can have headers, uh, defining things, you can bold, simple text. Uh, player aids, yeah, that's a great example. Card layout, yes, that's perfect. Cards, you're trying to get a lot of information on a tiny sheet of paper. And so typographic hierarchy is exceptionally important. The example I have here is uh, map design. So uh, this is from Empire of the Sun. Look how the map uses hierarchy. Uh, we have the big countries, uh, China, Malaya, um, those are some of the more important uh, countries in, on the board. Uh, those are in big text. The smaller ones, Laos, Vietnam, they're a little less important for the game, so they're in smaller uh, font. Additionally, the uh, ocean spaces have a different color to set those off. And you can see Indian Ocean is in giant uh, text, Bay of Bengal is in smaller. The Indian Ocean is more important than the Bay of Bengal. And so this is a, a pretty good use of typographic hierarchy. It's also very consistent. You can see the islands are all named with italics. The mainland is uh, not italicized, but in all caps. Yep, good point, Ken. All right, uh, next up we have minimalism. Uh, minimalism is uh, kind of a best practice in UX design. Um, I'm defining minimalism broadly. That might be ironic, I'm not sure. But uh, one, another big slogan people say is eliminate anything that says nothing. What does that mean? That means you don't want any, you don't want uh, extraneous detail in your solution because that's distracting. That will take the user away from the fundamental point you're trying to make. <laughs> so just because something's beautiful doesn't mean it's usable. And remember, you're not, painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling here. You are making a game. So uh, usability can be beautiful and you should focus on usability over beauty. But a good, uh, a good usable solution can be beautiful. They're not mutually exclusive. It's just you should prioritize usability. Uh, and I don't mean this just visually. So uh, you wanna review your work uh, as you're doing play testing and uh, iterate, iterating new designs. Uh, think to yourself, what can you remove without losing anything? Is there a mechanic that's super complicated that's not really doing much? Can you take it out? Is there a player role that doesn't have too much to do? Can you take that person out? Uh, are there rules exceptions you don't really need? Can you make things more consistent? Uh, think about it in that way. An important thing to remember is that gaming is an art of abstraction. Uh, you are not gonna make a game that, carry, that uh, portrays everything in a conflict you have to choose what you're portraying. So anything that you add that is unnecessary is uh, mental overhead space that could be taken out by something more useful. Uh, so keep that in mind. So a, uh, sorry, Connor has a question. How do you remedy that with good art to where the information from play either overwhelms the art or vice versa? <clears throat> that is a huge challenge of gaming. Um, typically, um, I, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think, uh, basically, I think the art should be subservient to the design and not vice versa. So um, if, uh, basically, if the art uh, portrays the hierarchy that you're trying to portray, if the art serves the rules, that's great. If the art is distracting, that's bad. So if you see, uh, if you see a board with a whole bunch of countries on it that aren't involved in the actual game. Uh, that might look nice, but that's not good design. You wanna limit the space, the cognitive space 
that players have. Um, yep, Ken mentions uh, iter testing, A-B testing. Yep, that's, that's another good way. If you test with the users, they'll help you uh, understand what's unnecessary, what's distracting, and what is necessary. All right, a uh, non-gaming example is logo design. Who here has seen the logo on the left? It's, uh, it's a lot, it's, uh, it's very beautiful visually, but uh, if I just saw that logo, if I didn't read Apple Computer Company, I don't think I would know what the company sold. And maybe that's true for the one on the right too. But uh, the reason the one on the right has become so iconic is because it's simple. Whereas the one on the left, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of extraneous text. There's, uh, it's very complicated and your brain just kind of glazes over, has trouble focusing on what it needs to focus on. One on the right, you know that's an Apple, you know Apple makes computers, you're already there. Uh, can someone think of an example of minimalism in game design? Yep, uh, Ken mentions the golden ratio. Um, yep, Connor mentions Azul. That's, uh, that's a very good example of a game that's beautiful, but still pretty simple. Uh, the, the beauty of the game doesn't distract from the mechanics. It adds to it. Yep, Jeff mentions Battleship. Yep, nothing extraneous there. Uh, yep, Roll for the Galaxy. Uh, it's a very, um, yep. Yep, lots of uh, minimalist games coming through in the chat. So uh, I'll give this example. This is the game Bus by uh, Splatter Spellin. Essentially, um, the game originally came out and looked like the one on the left. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that's beautiful or ugly. This is a very controversial game in terms of its visual design. But uh, suffice to say, all that decoration, uh, while definitely striking, didn't add to the actual game mechanics. So when they redesigned it, they made the version on the right. And yes, it looks more boring maybe, but you immediately get at the mechanics and it's a much more playable experience. All right, uh, then we have consistency. So when possible, you wanna use consistent mechanics and graphics. Uh, again, this is meant to lower the cognitive overhead of your players. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a game with a red team and a blue team, you want uh, the red side and the blue side to be on the same side of every board. Uh, if you have a set of cards, you want the numbers to be placed in the same way. Uh, you want to use the same colors for each team. You want to use a limited number of fonts so that any sort of font change actually means something. Uh, these are methods of using consistency. So as I mentioned, uh, consistency makes things simpler for the players. It reduces cognitive overhead. Uh, it's hard enough to learn one thing, uh, much less learn multiple things, unnecessarily. So the non-gaming example I have here, you might not know Spanish, French, or Thai, but you immediately know what the sign means. And if you drove in one of these countries, you would not uh, get in a fiery wreck here necessarily. Uh, these, there is a global standard that stop signs have to be uh, octagons that are red. And uh, this has undoubtedly saved lives uh, across the planet. And so when think of an example of uh, consistency in gaming, Right, uh, I may have sort of mentioned one already, but uh, here we have card design. Yep, uh, Ken mentions reuse of game terms and die rolling conventions. So some games it's five and six are hits and that works no matter uh, what section of the game there is. Um, so here, uh, going back to uh, Pax Perferiana, which is a genius game, but I have some issues with its graphic design. Um, if you can look carefully, uh, we have a set of symbols on these cards that are all over the place. So every card you get will have similar symbols, but they might be in different places. So card on the left, you see the top two cards. There is a oval command icon that is in the top center of the left card and the top right of the right card. Uh, that makes your brain think more than it has to. And your goal as a user experience or a game designer is to not make your players think 
make them think as little as possible. So on the right, we have cards from Twilight Struggle. This is more consistent. You can see every card has a star in the upper left-hand corner to show the side of the card as a number. Uh, it has uh, a little banner to say what part of the Cold War the card is played in, uh, consistent title placing, et cetera. Uh, this is easier to parse. You can hold the, the whole uh, hand of cards in your hand and immediately see the numbers and have an idea of where everything is. Yep, uh, good point, Ken. All right, so I threw a whole bunch of UX design at you. Uh, what are the lessons for wargaming? So uh, in general terms, uh, wargaming can learn a lot from uh, more formalized fields. Uh, wargaming is still growing as an academic discipline, but a lot of the work we need to do has already been done. And we should reach out and borrow from such bizarre fields as uh, UX design. Wargaming is an art of empathy. Uh, you want your designs to be user-friendly, uh, centered on the user, centered on the player, centered on the player as a human being. Uh, you want to be friendly to the human beings playing your games. If you're friendly to your players, your players will be friendly to you. Uh, lessons for wargaming as a process. You want to use an iterative process of design and testing, uh, alternate between divergent and convergent thinking. Uh, a lot of these things are already uh, best practices for wargaming as described by Peter Perla, Applegate, et cetera. But um, th these are the best practices and they're good to follow. Uh, when you need to, feel free to map out journeys to understand uh, the path players might take, the conflicts different players might have, points of cooperation. Uh, feel free to map that stuff out. That is very useful to do that. Uh, you want to define users and stakeholders. You might not need formal uh, user personas like I showed earlier, but you definitely want to consider them in design thinking. So be empathetic. Think about what would um, what would my sponsor need? What would they benefit from, et cetera? Uh, and then design and stages. Go from low fidelity to high fidelity. Sometimes people push back a little bit if you offer a hand-drawn solution in a meeting, but um, They'll get used to it over time as you just move it over time. Uh, test early and frequently in a cyclical rule process with design, and then uh, test different sections separately and then together. Uh, uh, John, I'll get to your question in a second. I'm almost done. Uh, some lessons for concepts. Again, be user focused, empathetic, you don't design for yourself. Um, when possible and beneficial, use metaphor and affordances to make your game design more intuitive. Uh, sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you need to be simple, but uh, when it benefits you, use them. And then uh, feel free to steal best practices from graphic design. Hierarchy is important, minimalism, consistency. Uh, these are kind of basic concepts of graphic design, and they're as useful for gaming as they are for any other. Lastly, uh, accessibility helps everybody. I can't uh, insist enough to be accessible in your games um, and that'll be better for everybody. Uh, here are some uh, places where you can learn more about UX design. Uh, all the websites I listed here are free, so uh, you have no excuse not to read them a little bit. A little bit. Uh, I highly recommend the Nielsen Normal Group website. They have great articles, great videos, and uh, they basically define the field. All right. Um, so uh, I went a little bit over the 45 minutes, but I uh, still have about an hour for questions. So what do we have? Right, uh, John Pett asks, uh, do you ever consider removing or limiting UX best practice interface from a gameplay to enhance the gameplay or mimic the fog of war? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> At some point, if you're modeling a situation, let's say you're modeling um, C2 structure that's failing, um, fog of war, as you mentioned, lack of information, uh, there's ways to kind of uh, uh, install those dark uh, patterns I mentioned earlier. And you can use those to your benefit if you're actually trying to mess with your players. Um, I, sh I should say, be careful with this. Don't intentionally make your game mechanics confusing, um, but make the interface between the game mechanics and the actual decision making 
you can make that confusing if you want. It's um, basically don't make the game hard to play, but if you're gaming out a situation that is hard, make sure the game is hard in the right way. Don't make it confusing unnecessarily. There's um, another, sorry, there's an older question. I'm not sure if you got to it. It was with respect to affordances, what would you say is a healthy cross between simplification and giving multiple ways for a user to solve a problem? Um, I think I touched on that a little bit, but okay. essentially um, you want to use affordances to narrow the gap between the player and the mechanics, not to narrow the gap between the mechanics and uh, the actual gameplay and the actions of the player. Um, right, I think Connor asks, uh, how come you didn't touch on the cognitive aspect of UX design in relation to the steps a user or player may need to take in order to complete an aspect of gameplay and the importance to minimize that unless part of the game experience? That's a very good point. Um, that, um, I agree with that point. I just didn't uh, neglect to mention it, but that, that is a very important point. Right, Jeff E. asks, uh, what non-gaming user experience most influenced your design of Tyranny of Blood? Oh, geez. Um, um, well, I'd say, uh, I'd say in historical uh, hobby gaming, the main inspiration is kind of the real world history. And so in that, it was basically, I don't know if I want to describe this user experience terms, but reading the history and understanding the interplay among uh, uh, different groups in uh, the history kind of informed my game a little bit. So uh, as I abstracted from the real history, I focused on uh, the aspects of the history that were most critical to the story I wanted to tell. Um, in terms of user experience, um, Uh, I'm not entirely sure I have to think about that. It's, it was mostly uh, thinking about it in terms of game mechanics more so than non-gaming user experience. Sorry, that's kind of a cop-out answer. But... Um, Natalia asks, are there any elements you took from Wargaming to UX? <clears throat> um, yes, there's a lot of, I focus on uh, the, the direction from UX to Wargaming, but there is a lot uh, that you can do in return. More, uh, more in terms of uh, the structured analytic techniques and liberating structure that I mentioned, but essentially um, a lot of user research is effectively a game. It's you are creating a scenario, you are telling the users, hey, you have this scenario, you're playing through these steps, you have this objective, how do you get there? And so, uh, Wargaming is actually a pretty useful uh, tool to get at that. Um, and uh, I mean, you can think of kind of a user testing scenario as basically being a war game. It's, you set up the players in a war game, you provide a system of rules, and you get them to play through it. All right, uh, Sebastian asks, how does UX experience change from commercial games to professional games? Uh, very good question. Um, the, the basic key is the focus is different. Um, and I think commercial games, um, commercial games benefit from being fun a lot more. And uh, part of being fun is kind of catering to the player's needs. And uh, I think you can afford to do that a lot more in commercial gaming, especially um, more abstract commercial gaming. You're not limited by the real world as much. So, I think metaphor is a lot more important in professional wargaming because you have to have that tie back to the real world in a way that you don't necessarily have to in commercial. All um, Ken asks, do you still hold to someone can keep track of five things plus or minus two for the short-term memory is unreliable as a metric for designing user interfaces and games? Yes. So uh, Ken mentions a very important rule. Basically, there's best practices for uh, chunking information. Um, and there's a whole 
subset of uh, user experience design called information architecture. It's very fascinating. I didn't have time to talk about it much. But essentially, if you have a, a giant amount of information, there's a way to, there's best practices to organize it and to put it in manageable blocks that you bring to the program. So the best practice, as Ken mentioned, uh, is your short-term memory can uh, handle between three to seven items uh, before it gets confused. Um, I think that's a useful, useful metric for user interfaces in games. I think um, especially action lists, a lot of games have kind of C's of like whole lists of actions that you can take. And a lot of times that can be super overwhelming. Um, that was actually, uh, I forgot who asked about uh, UX design and uh, Tyranny of Blood, the hobby game I'm designing. But that was a useful thing. Originally I had way too many actions for each player to take. Uh, and I basically consolidated them into about five. And so they're effectively the same action for each player. They just meant slightly different things. So that simplified things a bit. Uh, I cut out all the actions that didn't really add too much and I made it so uh, the decision space was a lot smaller. Uh, granted, you might not wanna do that in a professional war game because maybe the players have a much broader set of decisions they can make and you want you want a little more free form to get analytical value. So if, uh, if you want things to be free form and you want to have a whole bunch of actions at player's disposal, I would recommend um, writing those well, having clear player aids, and then chunking them into small subsections. So maybe you could have like diplomatic actions separate from military actions, et cetera. So just to limit the amount of mental illness. Okay, uh, Ken asks, do you have metrics or best practices for how to teach complex multi-part procedures? Um, I think that goes back to your point earlier about uh, information architecture. It's basically, um, uh, if you have a whole bunch of, it, it's better instead of, if you have like a 19 part process, that's a lot. You wanna chunk that together. So maybe you have action phase and then you have five sub actions there. Um, again, minimalism, if you can get rid of, if you can get rid of sections of the process, do it. Um, and that will simplify everything. Uh, one um, a book I'd recommend skimming, um, can't remember the gentleman's name, but it's, uh, it, there's a book about checklists that's very good. Uh, it focuses on the best practices of checklist making. And uh, essentially checklists, for those who might not know, were basically invented by the Air Force because pilots had a tremendous number of uh, steps in the process to uh, take off and land a plane. And that was too much for uh, a person to remember. So by kind of chunking it well, by having a specific checklist that pilots could go through and check each one, uh, that made sure they followed all the steps. So they didn't forget something and they didn't risk lives. Uh, so I think that's kind of a, that, that's kind of a best practice for uh, uh, Libby asks, is there a UX design principle that you find is overlooked most often? Um, I think there's a tendency towards maximalism uh, in a lot of gaming, both uh, hobby gaming and professional gaming. Um, and it's a little more forgivable in professional gaming because you do want players to have a realistic set of actions they can take. But, excuse me, uh, sometimes the rule set can be too much. Sometimes there's too many exceptions uh, to the rules. There's too many possible actions and uh, you wanna to try to limit that as much as you can. Uh, Connor asks, uh, does any UX go out the window depending on your time frame and the audience you're designing a game for? And if so, what is your hierarchy of what to leave out versus absolutely adhere to? Um, <clears throat> so for, for professional wargaming, uh, you, this, this kind of gets at the importance of getting your uh, fundamental research question solid and to define uh, your uh, DCMP, your data collection management plan. Essentially, you want to have a list of essential questions. You want to trim that to the bone. You're not going to be able to solve all problems in your war game. You really want to get at a core 
a uh, number of problems, a number of questions that you want to answer. Um, and so I think for professional wargaming, the main hierarchy is analytical. You really want to focus on the objective. For commercial uh, gaming, it's a little more, there's a lot more answers. Um, if you're talking about uh, historical gaming, I think uh, I think the hierarchy there's a there's an ethical hierarchy that you have to consider. Like if you abstract certain things out of history, that could be problematic very fast. Um, there's also a hierarchy of fun. So if something is kind of dull, if something's not pulling its weight, you can take it out uh, in hobby gaming, not not professional gaming. And I, I think uh, in, in hobby gaming, there's a story you want to tell, and that should define the hierarchy. What, what story do you want to tell? What aspects do you really need to hit on? What aspects can you abstract out, et cetera? Yes, uh, Atul Gawande's Checklist Manifesto. Thank you. I cannot remember either the book or the, the author's name. Uh, awesome. Uh, I think I went through all the questions. Is it, did I miss anyone's questions? I think you got all of them. Okay. All right, in that case, I think we're about done, ready to wrap up. If you have any last questions, drop them in the chat now. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending. We'll post the recording on our YouTube channel. Yes, go ahead. I think Natalia has a question. Um, maybe you could mention your design uh, and how UX influenced it. Um, so my design process, it was, uh, it was iterative in this way. Um, the prototype I have is still largely black and white. Um, there's no art in it. And it's, um, again, I started, I sketched out, um, different players I wanted to have, their interactions. And then I came up with a bunch of systems by which you could play out those interactions. And then I kept refining. I threw away a lot of stuff. Um, I simplified a lot of things. I minimalized uh, certain mechanics. Um, I changed a lot of the graphics and a lot of the mechanics to be consistent across the board. Um, so essentially, I tried to follow all the uh, concepts and best practices I mentioned. We'll see how well I succeeded. I uh, still have a lot of work to do, but uh, a lot of iterations to go. Hopefully by next year, it'll be out in shelves. Uh, Aurelia has a very good point. Uh, what happens when multiple personas or target audiences have conflicting interests? This is a really difficult problem. Um, I think for, uh, for professional wargaming, you want to work with your sponsor, make sure that uh, at some point, there's somebody who can make final decisions on things. Um, you want to work with a sponsor to make sure the game both accomplishes the sponsor's objectives as well as is targeted. Uh, so many uh, professional war games fail because they try to be everything to everybody, and you can't do that in one game. Um, and so that's part of the professional management of expectations, um, especially with your various stakeholders. Make sure people understand, make sure it's clear early on what you can achieve with this board game versus what you can't. Uh, because if you get too far in the design process before you clarify those expectations, it becomes a lot harder. You wanna get that right at the beginning. Um, so ideally you would get the, uh, you would define the questions well before you even uh, picked up a pencil and even thought about designing things. Um, and then you would also do all the research needed before you get to that point. Because um, once you start designing, it's a lot harder to, to turn that train around. Any more questions? Okay, I think that's it.
this time. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sebastian.